he's saying, all can come, all can hang out with me. Jesus is shaking up the status quo. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He saw your first breath before it happened, and he knows your last breath before it ever ends. God delivers, God saves, God rescues. I mean, that's cool. I got chills. There is no disease, there is no disposition or depravity that can separate you from the love of God, which is yours through Christ Jesus. Church, how are you? That was better than I thought it was going to be. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so um, had a lot of fun preparing this yesterday. And uh, about a month ago when I was up here, I was telling you guys I would really hope that the Lord would take me in a vision to see something really cool. Well, it didn't happen. But last night it did. Um, and it's not some, some holy kind of vision that you would think. It was more of a dream slash nightmare. Um, how many of you, show of hands, has, has spoken in public before? Had people looking at you? Oh, excellent. Have you guys heard of that fear of your standing up in, from, in front of a group and you forgot an article of clothing? So we were, it, it wasn't my house, but it felt like it was my house. It, it was probably like rest house because there was like gorilla tape and wires going everywhere that you could see. Um, but I forgot to put a shirt on. And so I'm running around trying to find my closet, and my closet is not where it was supposed to have been. And then I was trying to find my dresser just to find a shirt to put on because there was about this many people um, sitting waiting for me. The music was done, the video was done, and I had no shirt. And then as time went on, um, I had no pants. And I'm running around my house Trying to find clothes to put on, it was super weird. Uh, this was 2.50 in the morning. Um, and, and if anybody knows me, like, I have zero issues with sleeping. It takes me a while to fall asleep, but once I'm out, I'm out. Um, isn't that right, Summer? She won't say yes out loud because she fears public speaking, too. So, I get back in bed, and, and I have no problem going back to sleep. If Summer would have woke up... Um, she would have been up uh, all night. Well, then I wake up again. And it, this time it wasn't a cool dream. It was our German shepherd got in the bed and woke everybody up. It was a little before six, is that right? And God started speaking with me, y'all. Um, like, God, you had all day yesterday. Okay. So since I didn't play the bass today, I got to sleep in a little bit. But no, he's got to get me up right before 6. And I'm, so I'm sitting in her bed. I was like, I'll remember that. I'll remember that. And I was like, no, I won't. Dang it. So anyway, and I'm not going to tell you uh, what he had me um, to add to this, but it makes perfect sense. Because I thought I was going to say this when I opened. I have a gift for you today. Uh, well, I, I'm having to take this gift back. And, and the gift was going to be a short sermon. Um, Sorry. So the, the sermon may still be short, but the service won't be. So, um, so we are in uh, 1 Timothy. Uh, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus were all books that Paul wrote, and, and it's really the epistles to the pastors. Now, a pastor is a leader in the church. Um, but realistically, if you are here and you know Christ as your Savior, you're a leader also. You are, whether you, whether you like it or not, like you have been given um, a job to do, and that's the lead. So realistically, this is for us. And I'm so, so glad that I have the opportunity to preach this, this passage today because it has slapped me in the face. It's something that I've known, but I've let and kind of slide by the wayside and slap me in the face. And well, I hope to slap yours this morning as well in the nicest way possible. So... Um, just to recap, in week one, uh, we found that we are a family, and the church is a family, so we are in this together, okay? Uh, week two, last week, uh, you've been a, appointed to a, for a specific calling, so don't give up. And so, today, we are going to be in 1 Timothy 2, uh, verses 1 through 7. You don't have to throw them up there yet. 
but it's about prayer. Um, prayer is so important. It's not like a, uh, an appetizer, an hors d'oeuvre, or dessert. Like, this is, like, man, first and foremost, like, the prayer is so important. And if I'm being real, prayer is more important at times the message coming from the mouth of a man. So, just to really put this into perspective, think about this. Jesus, who is God, in the Garden of Gethsemane before His crucifixion, what is He doing? What is He doing? He's praying. Who is He praying to? The Father. Well, Jesus says, dude, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because He and I are one. Yet He still thought it was important enough to pray. Okay? That's one example. Here's another, and I'll hit this up a little bit later as well. The disciples, so Jesus sends out the disciples to go and do their work. And one of the things that he has them do is cast out demons. Well, Jesus is walking up and there's this huge commotion. His disciples are there. He's like, what's going on? He's like, well, I've got this kid. Uh, he's probably a young man, but, but he has been possessed since he was a child. And we cannot cast this one out. Jesus says it's because of your unbelief. And so the father of the son says, I believe. Help my unbelief. And so Jesus casts out the spirit. And then his disciples come up to him afterwards when they're by themselves. And they say, man, Jesus, I mean, like, like we, we did what you told us. Why couldn't we cast this one out? And he says this. Because this one was special. This demon was deaf. And it was mute. And it only comes out by prayer. Now, what kind of demon was this again? Deaf. Mute. He couldn't hear. And he couldn't speak. Yet the power of prayer drove it out of this young man. And then finally, this is my favorite. So you have Moses. God chose Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt, right? So they are walking through the wilderness. And you got to understand, like, they are a stubborn people. Stubborn. They get to see all these miracles, and they're walking through the desert. And like, oh, yo, Moses, man, we're so thirsty. I, we, we just want to go back to slavery in Egypt. And it's like, no, no, no. So God miraculously gives them water. God miraculously feeds them every single day with sweet honey bread from, hand, uh, from heaven, manna. Every morning. They don't have to do anything for it. Just go out their door and get it. And they say, oh, Moses, man, dude, we're so hungry. So God gives them quail to eat so they can have meat. But they're so stubborn all the time. And then finally, like, God comes up to Moses and says, hey, yo, Mo, man, we got to talk. Listen, I've had it with these, with these people. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to start over with you. Moses prays. Okay, this is God, the Father, saying this to Moses. Moses is a man. Moses prays. He says, God, please don't. Like, for the sake of your name, please don't. Spare them. The prayer of a man changed the heart of God. So where is it in our church? Where is it? I mean, we pray when we open service. We pray when we close. We pray when we have our meetings. Oh, guys, this is such an important part of the church. So, what is prayer? Prayer is not some super sophisticated um, sort of secret code that you have with God. It is literally a conversation. It is a conversation. Now, is there structure to it? Absolutely. Does God really care about that in the end? No. So, who is God, first of all? God is the king and the creator, but he is also our father. You know, where do we call him? Abba Father, Papa, Daddy. And we are his children. That prayer is a communication between a child and a father. I can't imagine having kids that never talk to us. I actually have one that hibernates. Not, not, not Bella. 
Ellie, if you're watching, it's you. I hadn't seen her all day, and then she comes in. She goes right upstairs. She's like, what are you doing? So I'm, I'm going to bed. I'm tired. Yeah. Um, but that lack of communication as a parent, it hurts. You know, I'm not trying to say that you're hurting us, Ellie, uh, if you're watching. Just trying to say, we, we want that communication. Why? Because we're your parents. And we want that communication. So, so not only is it a conversation between a father and child, and then this is something else that really illustrates the importance of it. Armor of God. You know it? Raise your hand. Okay. So, great. Thanks. Um, Ephesians 6.18 says that prayer is an accompaniment to the armor of God. It is that important. Why? For offense, for defense. So, uh, worship team, you guys couldn't have picked better songs this morning. The veil. You know, once upon a time, the presence of God dwelt inside the tabernacle, which was a portable temple. And there were priests that would serve there because uh, at that time, um, God was separated from man, even though His presence dwelt where it was visible. But there was a veil that was between um, the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God dwelt and mankind. And there was one man, one high priest appointed from the tribe of Levi to be a mediator between man and God. One man was able to go to the throne room. Okay, well that tabernacle becomes a temple, a building, a church, where the veil remained. The veil separated the Holy of Holies from mankind. When Jesus died, that veil was torn from top to bottom. Why? Well, for one, to get rid of uh, the human priest to usher in the everlasting priest, Jesus. But not only that, so while we were once separated from an almighty loving God, with the death of Jesus, that veil is torn, so that throne room is open and accessible. And we approach it with boldness. What does God want to know from us? What does God want to hear from us as we talk to Him? He wants to hear our thanks. He wants to hear our praise. He wants to hear our struggles. He wants to hear our needs. And He also wants us to approach His throne on behalf of those that can't get there themselves. So, as Jesus intercedes, on behalf of mankind, he wants us to intercede for those. Like he wants us to intercede for them as well, for those that we know and those that we don't. And we'll look at that a little bit. So, um, so today again, we'll be looking at First uh, Timothy two one through seven. And before we put this up, there's a main point. The main point is prayer, prayer for the prayer for and proclaiming the gospel to all kinds of people because God desires their salvation and Christ died. As a ransom for all, not some, but for all. So this passage, these seven verses, is broken down into four categories. We're going to spend a decent amount of time on the first two and really fly through the, um, the last two. But it's this. The first category is the initial exhortation. The second is the theological motivation. Three is the obvious implication. And four is the coming conclusion. So let's read it together and then we'll break it down. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people, all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, for there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, 
who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you. And I also want to say that I'm sorry. God, I want to thank you for being an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-controlling God that is full of loving kindness for his creation and for me. God, I want to thank you for the power of these words that we're going to be looking at today. God, I pray that you would speak through me um, to clearly illustrate the importance of what we're looking at. Father, please show up in a big way today. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Okay. It is no uh, secret that we now live in a hostile culture. Um, this culture is also hostile to anybody claiming to know absolute truth. Because let's face it, in this day and age, we, not the church, but we uh, collectively as a people, fight for uh, the right not to party. For all you old folk. We fight for the right to do or to allow everybody to do what is right in their own eyes. Am I wrong? No. But I tell you what, like when, when you as a Christian, even filled with grace, try to express your beliefs, how is it received? Hate. And it couldn't be further from the truth. So we live in a hostile culture. So you can live however you want. But don't impose your beliefs on me, especially your religious beliefs. And when I say religious, man, it, it really boils down to Christianity. Let's be fair. Because the enemy is only going to fight the one true religion. So we must be accepting of all and any uh, lifestyles. This is the new norm. Uh, I'm really starting to feel a little old uh, because, you know, you can see how the enemy slowly tries to introduce something that is um, controversial and then it is slowly accepted and then he slides in a little more and he slides in a little more and it is terrible right now. I don't know why I'm holding my hands like this, I am. I keep doing it. Um, uh, I just, so I just made it awkward for myself. Um, but, but seriously, but that's the new norm. But as I was studying these scriptures, I was seeing that he is also trying to cripple something in the life of believers that is so powerful. Okay. So, this new norm is nothing new from Old Testament times, like from Old Testament times. And this would drive me nuts. Because you would see like the, the men of Iskar who understood the signs of the times. Like these, are guy, these were guys that could look at what was happening in the world. It's like, nope, yep, right on schedule. Yep, that's happening because this is happening. But then you'd have another group, of, another group of people. And this describes us like so much today. It was people who are doing what was right in their own eyes. The way that they're living is right. And now we defend it. Like as a nation, as a world, like we're defending it not the church. Blind to the truth. So the absolute message that we as believers carry is this. Jesus is the cornerstone. And there is no other name under heaven given to people and we must be saved by it. That's the absolute truth that we carry. That is the message that we carry. So while the enemy is moving to silence us, we are given a great commission. Go. Make disciples of all nations. All nations. 
No one is left out. No specific category of people. No specific nation. Go and make disciples of all nations. Hey, throw up that slide for me, would you? The absolute and exclusive claims of the Gospels is to be made known universally. That way, that, that's not the right one, but that's fine. Um, we must not become numb to the needs of those around us by focusing on the insides of these walls. Guys, we, I'm guilty of that because that's me getting out of my comfort zone. We cannot become numb to the needs of those around us. Lord, continually open our eyes. This is for me. Lord, continually open our eyes to this. Let us not become self-centered. Let us think outside. Okay. Our hearts must, our hearts must come in line with God's heart because he desires for all to be saved, for all to come to repentance. So, so Paul provides a gospel foundation in chapter 1 of his letter to Timothy. And he commands Timothy to guard, celebrate, and fight uh, for the gospel. With that foundation laid, Paul gives practical exhortation to the church, to us, here in chapter 2. And again, you know, like I said, this is, these were letters written to pastors. But if you are here as a believer, you are a leader as well. So this is for you too. So, this is my absolute favorite part. Blew me out of the water. Out of all these verses, out of this whole message, this is what blew me like out of the water and just like slapped me across the face. Paul opens with this, first of all. First of all, of everything that you're doing, of everything that you're working to achieve, first of all of it, pray. And the key for these scriptures, the key for believers and for the church, right here in verse 1. This is the key. So how do we guard, celebrate, fight for the gospel? You start by what, church? Praying. You start by praying. It's, it's the easiest thing that you can do. Where can you pray? Huh? Everywhere. Like, you don't have to get dressed. You don't have to brush your hair. You don't have to put on your makeup. You don't have to brush your teeth. You don't have to get out of bed. To pray. So why aren't we? First of all, first of all, pray. It's the easiest thing that you can do. So, do you want to have an influence on the lost people around you? Pray. Try to get my hands away from each other. You want to have an influence on presidents and world rulers? Like, you're not going to go down to the White House. You're not going to go uh, visit old Vlad Putin. But you can influence them. You don't have to send some nasty email. You can influence them. How? Prayer. Okay, so you have, again, going back to what I was talking about with uh, old Moses. God says, Moses, I'm going to kill everybody. I'm going to start again with you, man. These people, I'm done. I'm done. Oh, God, please. No, for the sake of your name, no. All right, Moses. All right. So do you want to have an influence today? Pray. Do you want to have an influence? Uh, excuse me. Do you want to be part of seeing people getting out of hell and going to heaven? Pray. And, and as I was putting together, I saw it. So oh my gosh. If I just pray, God... So, so man plays his ways, God directs his path, right? Okay, so, oh God, you know, just 
put me at the right place at the right time. He will make sure that as he's guiding your path, you will be at that right spot at the right time and give you the words to say. Nothing that you've got to prepare for. Um, it's just going to come naturally. Why? Because if you're praying for those things, it's like you're taking the steering wheel to your car and you're giving it to him and say, dude, drive. And he's going to drive you. And he's going to make sure you're at the right place at the right time so that you can say the right words, which hopefully, if you are walking with him, they're not your words at all, they're his. Which is my prayer that I've been praying for me this morning because if any good comes from this today, it's not me, it's him. That's my prayer. So, verse 1, Paul tells us to pray for everyone. And then in verse 2, he tells us exactly who to pray for. We are to pray for all people. I realize that can be difficult. Oh, Isaac knows some difficult people that I know that I struggle to pray for because, God, they don't deserve my prayers. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, there is no category of people we should not be praying for. Second, we are to pray for leaders in high positions. This is our duty. Are you patriotic? This is your duty. This is not just for Christian leaders, but for those who are not as well. Pray for those that you approve of and those who you do not. Pray for those also with authority over you. This is your duty. Okay, and, and consider this. So Paul is telling this to Timothy, okay? And for us, I have to pray for leaders that are persecuting us. To really put things into perspective here, like at this time, you have this Roman uh, emperor, Nero. Well, what's Nero doing? Dude, what's his name? Like Nasty Nero or Nero the Nasty? Something like that? Okay. Gladiator games. You know what I'm talking about in the Colosseum? Nero. This is something else that he did. Not only was he bringing Christians to the Colosseum for these gladiator games, for them to be brutally murdered, he would also have parties. And he would take Christians, look it up, cover them in pitch and tar, and use them as human candles, human torches, to light his parties. Paul says, pray for your leaders. Pray for your leaders. would be the equivalent you know to really help uh, our, 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 uh, our visual on this it would be the equivalent of saying hey Jews I realize Hitler is killing you by the millions pray for him how easy would that be folks well I said folks I'm sorry Jeez. so now that we know who to pray for Paul also tells us what to pray for we're given specific instructions. Pray that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life. And this is not just saying, hey, listen, I, I'm praying for my leaders so that they can give me the life that I want because really I'm a homebody. I just want to go home. I'll go upstairs in my bedroom and, and do my tic-tac, snip snip. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I know what it is. It's TikTok things. <laughs> I was trying to sound like an old dad. Nailed it. Um, Thank you. All right. So, pray that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. It is the kind of peace time where the church is able to thrive with no rules, with no regulations, with no one stopping them from doing the work that the church has been called to do. Pray for your leaders. Guys, right now, whether we realize it or not, the church is under attack. Pray that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life and so that the gospel message that we are given can get out there. Not just 
here at Res, not just Paducah, but globally, it is also our job to pray for those churches. So, not only should we pray for peace during our persecution, but the salvation of our persecutors. I'm not going to name names, but every day I'm like, Father, this. I pray that they come to saving faith. Because I believe that God has put a calling on all of our lives. A calling for salvation. But we've got to pick up that phone and answer it. But God took it to heart strings. So, so first of all, church, we must pray. Okay, and then throw up the next slide. It starts with the progress. There we go. The progress of the gospel in the world is dependent on the prayers of God's people in the church. Read that again. The progress of the gospel in the world is dependent on the prayers of God's people. First of all, pray. Are you starting to see the importance of prayer? Maybe even a little bit more? And I'm talking to me because I got slapped square across the face. Um, remember the power of prayer. Moses was able to sway the heart of God by praying to him, by conversing with, by having a conversation with him. God, please don't. If prayer can move God's heart, do you not think it can move the heart of a man? Hmm. Think about this. Moses was one man. Change the heart of God. What if we as the church, collectively around the world, were of one mind, in one spirit, praying for the same thing? Imagine what could happen. Imagine what could happen. Could it be that through the power of prayer and us giving God that steering wheel, that he would place us in the right time, give us the right words to say, to make an impact on this nation, to make an impact in this church, in this city, in the world. To impact lives with the gospel. Okay, moving along, we're going to look at 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 6. So throw those slides up if you would. So we're told, first off before I read this, first of all, to pray. Pray for all. Pray for leaders in high positions. Verse 3, this is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved, all people to, to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. This brings us to our second uh, category, the theological motivation. So we know who and what to pray for, but what drives us to pray like this? So what is it? It is God's passion for the world. Who does he desire that is saved? All. He desires that all come to repentance, right? So the first motivation, we pray because God desires the salvation of all people. When you pray for friends and enemies, good and bad leaders, and the lost and the saved, your heart starts to line up with God's heart. We have got to take ourselves out of the equation and start praying like the heart of God. God says, or Jesus said, hey, if you like, pray in my name, these things will be given to you. In my name means in his character. Pray in my character. Our heart must line up with God's heart. So your heart is coming in line with his because he wants their salvation. He's not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. This does not mean that all will be saved. So don't let it beat you up when you've spent hours and hours and days and weeks and years with somebody and they don't come to saving faith because you are still doing the good work that you've been called to do. 
Don't let it get you down. Don't let it beat you up. Because not all will be saved. This all, uh, nor does it mean that God's will will be or has been thwarted. He knows that all are not going to come to repentance. He just knows that. It simply means this. God loves all people and he wants, he wants them all to be saved. But he loves us enough to give us a free will to either choose him or reject him. You know, I used to I used to view God as being a God that did us a favor of giving us salvation. He's like, hey, you know, I created these people. They really screwed it up, but mm, I guess I'll throw them a bone. Yeah, well, you know, that way you can be saved and then you come to me. It's not that at all. God created us, and yes, we screwed it up. But he still, regardless of that, desires that love. He, he is a being that has feelings. He is a being, a being that has needs as well. And, and I really feel that he is, um, well, I don't feel, I know that he wants to be loved by his creation. He wants to be loved by his children because he's our father. He tells us to call him daddy the creator of everything tells you to call him daddy. He will not force you to love him. Okay. The second motivation. We pray because God deserves the honor of all people. Amen? There is one God and he deserves the honor and praise of all people. We live, work, and go on life-saving missions around the world every day because we know that there is one God and He alone deserves all honor and praise. Worship. Worship is the fuel of a world praying. You know, I've said this before, not, not to you guys, but in band, this is actually like pretty recently. You know, worship um, is not just something that churches do. But worship is the means of a people drawing close to God. Psalm 100. Look it up. Worship is that fuel. And I can tell you, like back there, um, I was a little nervous because I was afraid I was going to come up here. It's like, oh great, am I, am I going to go up there and not have a shirt on? Um, but man, those last two songs really hit it home. And that was worship doing its job. So we gather with believers to, to declare there's one God. Worship is the goal of a world praying. And this is what we're after in our praying worldwide worship. Why? Because God deserves it. Um, this is what drives us. Reaching the lost, growing the saved. Why? To grow the kingdom. To increase the glory that's given to God because He alone deserves it. The third motivation. We pray because Christ died for the rescue for all people. So Jesus is unique. And I, and I almost got ahead of myself earlier and I, I refrained and that's difficult for me, but I did it. Uh, Jesus is unique in who he is. He is the perfect mediator. He is the only being in the history of beings from eternity past to eternity future that could ever fill that role, fulfill that role. Why? Because if you remember, the veil separated God and man. Jesus fully God, Jesus, fully man. And I'm going to back up to this scripture real quick. Um, I passed it. Verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. That last portion of that verse is declaring His deity, as well as his humanness. Fully God, fully man. So he is unique in who he is. He is the perfect mediator. 
because he alone can identify with both God and with man. He himself is fully God, fully man. Consequently, being fully man, he struggled as we do. Just as we do. So he understands. But then he is also um, living that life without sin. And at the same time, he's also fully God. So he knows God's righteous standard. So he can mediate between God and man. He alone is qualified for this. So not only is he unique in who he is, Jesus is unique in what he did. He gave himself a ransom by dying for all. Though he did not deserve death, he died, even though mankind alone owed the price, a price that realistically we were unable of paying. He did it. So God took the full payment of sin upon himself in the person of Jesus and rescued us from sin and death. The price was paid. The rescue was made. Finally, Jesus is unique in what he does. Jesus was our mediator on the cross. Now he lives on as our mediator. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, the place of honor, and continually making intercession for us. We know that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He is, he is nonstop going to the throne of God and accusing every single one of you. Accusing me. And then at G, or God's right hand is Jesus continually making intercession for us. You know, God, by my offering, I have made him perfect forever. By my one offering, I have perfected him forever. By what I did, he has become as righteous as I am righteous, God. Continually. Not only that, when uh, I said earlier, um, uh, does it matter like really what your prayer is? No, because when that prayer comes, that prayer is presented to Jesus, and he makes that prayer that may have some flaws perfect as he presents it to the Father. So he's unique in what he does. And Jesus is unique in that he leads us on a mission, the Great Commission. Not only that, but Jesus promises to be with us always. Always. I said it earlier. Pray. God, I pray for those opportunities. I pray for old so-and-so. Here's a steering wheel. Dude, you do what you do. I'm along for the ride. Oh, hey, how's it going? And then the words come out of your mouth. It happens. I promise you. Okay. So, he enables and empowers all that we do. Jesus leads his church by his word and through his spirit. We're getting ready to start the third category. Uh, throw up uh, verse 7. We're getting there, guys. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I am not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The obvious implication. As we pray to God for all people, we preach to all people. We preach the cross of Christ. As we pray to God for all people, we preach the gospel to all people. We know that God desires the salvation of all people. We know that he is worthy of the praise. We know that Christ died for their rescue. So, we should be sharing the gospel with everyone. Ask God to lead you in a way that people see. I, I just thought about this just now. Um, I, I use up my words pretty quickly. Like guys have like 5,000 words and girls have like 30 million words that have to be said in a day for them to be complete. Is it 30 million? I, thank you. Um, but sometimes I can get very busy and I'm not one for talk if I don't need to because I got a lot of work to do. Um, but this past Thursday, I said something to a guy that I don't work with, but he comes in. And he was talking, and we got to talking a little bit. And, and I'm never one to just throw out, like, play a pastor card. But I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. I, I'm, a, I'm a pastor of a couple of other guys here in town also. And do you know what he said to me? 
I knew there was something about you. I knew that there was something about you which opened the door for natural conversation. Not something that I had to prepare for, but for the overflowing love that I have for God, I was able to have just natural conversation with somebody. So don't be afraid about that witnessing that you hear about. Pray for God to take control, man. So, we should be sharing the gospel with everybody. We teach the commands of Christ. After people trust in the cross of Christ, we teach them the commands of Christ. This is part of the Great Commission. We make known the truth of God's Word, and this is what the church is to be about. There is a sermon right here that I would love to go into, but it's really not what I should be doing, so I'm not going to, but I'm going to give you a snippet. Ten Commandments, God's Old Testament law, like 613 commands summed up in ten. The purpose of this law was to show you your need of Savior. The purpose of this law was given so that your sin might increase. Why? To ultimately drive you to Christ. Okay. Once you meet Christ, the 613 summed up in ten is now summed up in two. And it's basically this. This is the royal law. Love God, love people. So we are to be out there making disciples so that we can teach those disciples to what? Love God, love people. And if you are doing those things, guys, you are, first of all, praying. So, this is the final point. I'm going to blow right through this one. The coming conclusion. We pray with confidence and preach with boldness because we know that our mission from the Great Commission will prevail. We know that. And we know that our mediator, Jesus Christ, will be praised. Not on blind faith, but by studying His Scriptures. Read the book of Revelation. It's there. Like, and it's, and it's, going to be so triumphant. It's going to be so spectacular. Uh, I can't wait to see it. So, the rapture is imminent. Part of this, this mission, the rapture is imminent. What is the rapture? The rapture is when believers of Jesus will be taken from this world And they will go and they will meet Jesus in the sky. And he will take them to heaven. It's coming. You study the scriptures, you find that everything in a certain order, and our God is a God of order, everything in this order that has to be complete for the rapture to happen has already happened. Matter of fact, uh, the rapture was imminent in Paul's day. Which means that we are drawn closer. The rapture is imminent. Well, while this church is gone, the church, from Acts 2 to the point of the rapture, those people are gone. There will be people that come to saving faith after. But there's something else that's coming, and it's called the Great Tribulation. And with the Great Tribulation comes a being. We know him as the Antichrist, who is going to make this world literally hell on earth especially for those that believe. This is coming. So this should fuel our prayer. This should fuel our worship in order to spread the gospel. We should become all things to all people so that we might save some. At the end of the tribulation, Revelation 19, Jesus will return riding on a chair and there will be his armies clothed in linens white and clean with him the church and he will come at right at the end of the tribulation and he will kill the antichrist and his armies and we get to watch all of this this is coming and then we will see with our own eyes the one God the one king 
receive the praise of all the world. We will see it with our own eyes. We know the end of the story. And we will join with all creation in the praise of our King. So, moving to the close. I want to talk to believers first. Have you, like I have at times, fell for the lie and not prayed as you should? I know you have. You don't have to answer that. Because that's me. I do it all the time. I don't pray before I eat. (gasps) Maybe I should. So I mentioned this earlier. Is it Mark 9? When the disciples could not cast the demon out of this young man. Jesus says, man, this kind only comes out by prayer. Prayer is important. First of all, pray. Prayers are more than just words. There is power in prayer. So I ask again, have you fallen for the lie and not prayed as you should? Prayer is our first line of defense. Prayer is our first line of offense. Prayer is powerful. Well, let me ask you something else. And when I'm asking you, I'm asking me because I'm the one that got slapped in the face first. Are you praying gospel-minded prayers? Are you praying for your friends? Are you praying for your enemies? Are you praying for those that you like? Are you praying for those that you don't? Are you praying for your president and for your government? Not a spiteful prayer, but a prayer of salvation and a prayer of godly leadership. Are you praying for those who preach the gospel? Are you praying for those that really need that protection as they go and then are you praying for opportunities to preach the gospel yourself I'm not saying that you're praying for some box to stand on over in front of Chick-fil-A at the mall so you can say you're all going to hell it's not not that at all but are you praying for those opportunities for you to bump into the right person at the right time and have the right things to say with that natural conversation believers ask yourself those things and now I want I want to switch to those who are not Christians I'm not first off let me back up what I want to say is this saying certain words at vacation Bible school or kids Sunday school or whatever will not save you Believing will save you. Confessing with your mouth will save you. So if you are here today, you must know, if you do not know Christ, there have been people that are praying for you to be here today. You are not here by mistake. If you don't know Christ, the reason that you are here is so that you can accept him. There have people that have been praying for you. Christ is simple. Salvation is simple. And it's basically this. You were born with a problem and it was a sin problem. It wasn't really your fault, but you had it. And because of that sin problem, you were separated from God. Well, the good news is that God sent His Son. And that Son lived a perfect life without sin, died on a cross, and received the full payment that was due on Him as he died well that man Christ Jesus was buried and he rose and he ascended to the heaven and he's seated at the right hand of the father and he's coming back to get us all you have to do is believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved you are not here by accident so everybody bow your heads I'm not really going to be able to see. But if you need Jesus 
today, if you are here without him today, you need to raise your hand. You've got to talk to somebody so that you can become saved. Okay, next. This is what I want to do. You guys can look back up here at me. I need a show of hands. And if I'm being perfectly honest, like I'm baiting you guys right now. This is what God woke me up for the second time early this morning. Dude, I know you were already up, but it was early for me. It's like 5.30. Were you already up? Nailed it. Okay. But he woke me up. And he said, this is what I want you to do. I need to see a show of hands of somebody here first that is thankful for something that God has done. All right. Excellent. I need to see a show of hands of somebody here that is hurting. Whether that be a marriage, whether that be a loved one. I want to see a show of hands of people that have needs where they need God to intervene. A show of hands of people that are lonely and need God to come alongside them and to hold them. Okay. Um, I think almost every hand has been raised here. So this is what I'm going to ask. Um, if there's any deacons that would come down, if the, if the prayer team would come down, if you raise your hand, you need to come up here and talk to somebody and pray with somebody. Why? Because first of all, pray. First of all, pray. Guys, we have got to be about prayer. Jesus said, my father's house will be called a house of prayer. Not a house of Johan talking. So, band, go ahead and play. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord, if you've got praise that you are thankful for, if you've got hurts that you just can't seem to mend, if you have anything that you need pray for, come down today. And let's first of all pray. Pray.